Good evening everyone. On 12th August 2022, Salman Rushdie was stabbed. More than 30 years after the issuance of the fatwa, Salman Rushdie once again faced an attack from an individual who represented that same mindless bigotry and belligerent divisiveness which has been haunting the world even more nowadays. The attack represents the assault on free speech which Rushdi has been fighting against with his own literary works and non-fictional writing for the past three decades. Today, we, on behalf of Plato's Caves, have gathered here on this virtual platform to pay homage to that verbal wizardry with which he has celebrated the human imagination and the global shared togetherness which binds us together against all the murderous hatred that the world is now being haunted by. Thank you for joining us and we hope that through the next few minutes you will enjoy listening to readings of different sections from Rushdie's work which will pay tribute to the man and his artistry. Thank you. We begin today's reading session with a reading by Shomrita Mishra who will be reading from Rushdie's own reflections on the fatwa, which sums up his own artistic credo. Good evening. I'll be reading the beginning passage in parts from a column that Salman Rushdie wrote titled February 1999, 10 years of the fatwa. Yes, all right. On February 14th, it will be 10 years since I received my unfunny valentine. I admit to a dilemma. Ignore the politics, which I had loved to do, and my silence must look enforced or fearful. Speak, and I risk deafening the world to those other utterances, my books, written in my true language, the language of literature. I risk helping to conceal the real Salman, behind the smoky sulphurous rujdi of the affair. I have led two lives, one blighted by hatred and caught up in this dire business which I am trying to leave behind, and the life of a free man freely doing his work. Two lives, but none I can afford to lose, for one loss would end both. When asked about the effect on my writing of the ten-year-long assault upon it, I have answered lightheartedly that I have become more interested in happy endings and that, as I have been told that my recent books are my funniest, the attacks have evidently improved my sense of humor. These answers, true enough in their way, are designed to deflect deeper inquiry. For how can I explain to strangers my sense of violation? It's as if men wielding clubs were to burst loudly into your home and lay it waste. Never again will you kiss or bathe or shit or ride without remembering this intrusion. And yet, to do these things pleasurably and well, you must shut out the memory. Amid the cacophony of the professionally opinionated and the professionally offended, may your voice still be heard celebrating literature, highest of arts, its passionate, dispassionate inquiry into life on earth, its naked journey across the frontierless human terrain, its fierce-minded rebuke to dogma and power, and its trespassers fearless daring. In these years I have met and been inspired by some of the world's bravest fighters for literary freedom. I recently helped set up a house for refugee writers in Mexico City. More than 20 cities already belong to this refuge city scheme and was proud to be doing a little to ease the struggles of others in danger from intolerance. But as well as fighting the fight, which I will surely go on doing, I have grown determined to prove 
that the art of literature is more resilient than what menaces it. The best defense of literary freedom lies in their exercise, in continuing to make untrammeled, uncowed books. So beyond what so beyond grief, bewilderment and despair, I have rededicated myself to our high calling. Thank you. Thank you, Shomrita, for reading those crucial lines. We will now move into that iconic text which first brought Rushdi to global limelight. Yes, the multiple Booker winning Midnight's Children. Shoma Bho will read a section from the Midnight's Children. First of all, I'd like to thank Tattoo's Case for organizing this wonderful evening on Rushdi. So um, tonight I'm going to read a few passages uh, from the third chapter of book one of Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. So here it goes. Please believe me that I am falling apart. I am not speaking metaphorically. Nor this is the opening gambit of some melodramatic, riddling, grubby appeal for pity. I mean quite simply that I have begun to crack all over like an old chair. That my poor body, singular, unlovely, buffeted by too much history, subjected to drainage above and drainage below, mutilated by dogs, brained by spittoons, has started coming apart at the seams. In short, I am literally disintegrating. Slowly for the moment, although there are signs of acceleration. I ask you only to accept, as I have accepted, that I shall eventually crumble into approximately 630 million particles of anonymous and necessary oblivious dust. This is why I have resolved to confide in paper before we forget. We are a nation of forgetters. There are moments of terror, but they go away. Panic, like a bubbling sea beast, comes up for air, boils on the surface, but eventually returns to the deep. It is important for me to remain calm. I chew betel nut and expect it in the direction of a cheap grassy bow, playing the ancient game of hit the spitting, Nadir Khan's game, which he learned from the old men in Agra. And these days, uh, you can buy rocket palms in which, as well as the gum reddening paste of the beetle, the comfort of cocaine lies folded in a leaf. But that could be cheating. Rising from my pages comes the unmistakable whiff of chutney. So let me obfuscate no further. I, Salim Sinai, Possessor of the most delicately gifted olfactory organ in history, have dedicated my latter days to the large scale preparation of condiments. But now, a cook? You gasp in horror. A consama merely? How is it possible? And, I grant, such mastery of the multiple gifts of cookery and language is rare indeed. Yet, I possess it. You were amazed, but then, I am not, you see, one of your 200 rupees a month cookery journeys, but my own master, working beneath the saffron and green winking at my personal union goddess, and my chutneys and kasondes are, after all, connected to my nocturnal scribbles. By day, among the pickle bats, by night, within these sheets, I spend my time at the great work of preserving memory as well as fruit, is being saved from the corruption of the clouds. Thank you. Thank you, Shomabo, for reading that illuminating section from The Midnight Children. Of course, Rushdie's own kaleidoscopic magic realism had a forerunner in the form of the writings of Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Rusty himself was always very respectful and appreciative of the genius of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Shayon will now read Rusty's comments and observations on Gabriel Garcia Marquez from one of his essays. 
a very small passage uh, on Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, by Salman Rushdie. This is from his collection of essays, uh, Imaginary Communes. Rushdie writes, uh, It seems that the greatest force at work on the imagination of Marquez himself is the memory of his grandmother. Many more formal antecedents have been suggested for his art. He has himself admitted the influence of Faulkner and the world of his fabulous Mukondo is at least partly Yokna Patawa County transported into the Colombian jungles. Then there's Borges and behind the Borges fonts and origo of it all, Machado de Aziz author of three great novels, Epitaph of a Small Winner, King Cas Borba, and Don Casmuro, that were far in advance of their times. Light in touch and clearly the product of a proto-Marquesian imagination. And Marquesa's genius for the unforgettably visual hyperbole, the Americans forcing a Latin dictator to give them the sea in payment of his debts, for instance, in the autumn of the Patriarch, and I quote, they took away the Caribbean in April, Ambassador Ewing's nautical engineers carried it off in numbered pieces to plant it far from the hurricanes in the blood-red dawns of Arizona, unquote, may well have been sharpened by his years of writing for the movies. But the grandmother is more important than any of these. In an interview with Louis Harts and Barbara Doman, Marquez gives her credit for his language. Marquez writes, she spoke that way, she was a great storyteller. Anita Desai has said of Indian households that the women are the keepers of the tales, and the same appears to be the case in South America. Marquez was raised by his grandparents, meeting his mother for the first time when he was seven or eight years old. His remark that nothing interesting ever happened to him after the age of eight becomes, therefore, particularly revealing. Of his grandparents, Marquez said to Haas and Dorman, and I quote, they had an enormous house full of ghosts. They were very superstitious and impressionable people. In every corner, there were skeletons and memories, and after six in the evening, you did not dare leave the room. Thank you, Shion, for your reading. We will now move into that multi-dimensional allegory with which Rushdi himself responded to the fatwa, Harun and the Sea of Stories. It is this novel which Rushdi wrote immediately after the issuance of the fatwa. And this is not just a personal narrative of an author who is trying to remain in touch with his family through a story, but it is also an allegory that champions freedom of speech, the power of literature against all kinds of totalitarian, dogmatic, censorious forms of power prevalent around us. Modhurima will read from Harun and the Sea of Stories. Thank you for introducing my text, Abinda. So yes, I'll be reading from Haron and the Sea of Stories and I have chosen the chapter called Was It the Walrus? And I want to read the passage where Haroon and the Walrus were discussing uh, the, about happy ending. So I'll just start. Haroon Khalifa said the walrus, getting to his feet, still slightly out of breath and holding his aching sides. To honor you for the incalculable service you have done to the peoples of Kahani and to the ocean of the streams of story, we grant you the right to ask of us whatever favor you desire. And we promise to grant it if we possibly can, even if it means inventing a brand new process too complicated to explain. Harun was silent. 
Well, Harun asked Rashid, any ideas? Harun was silent again, looking suddenly unhappy. It was Blabbermouth who understood his mood and came over to him, took his and came over to him, took his hand and asked, What is it? What's the matter? It's no use asking for anything, Harun answered in a low voice. Because what I really want is something nobody here can give me. Nonsense, retorted the walrus. I know perfectly well what you want. You have been on a great adventure and at the end of great adventures, everybody wants the same thing. Oh, and what's that? Asked Harun a little belligerently. A happy ending, the walrus said. That shot Harun up. Isn't it the truth? The walrus pressed him. Well, yes, I suppose it is, Harun admitted uncomfortably. But the happy ending I am thinking of isn't something you can find in any sea. Even a sea with plenty more fish in it. The walrus nodded slowly and judiciously seven times. Then he put his fingertips together and sat down at his desk, motioning to Harun and the rest that they should be seated too. Harun sat in a shiny white chair facing the walrus across the desk. The others sat in similar chairs, chairs that were lined up against the walls. <clears throat> the walrus began. Happy endings are much rarer in stories and also in life than most people think. You could almost say they are the exceptions, not the rule. You agree with me then, said Harun. So that's that. It is precisely because happy endings are so rare, the walrus continued, that we at P2C2E house have learned how to synthesize them artificially. In plain language, hmm, we can make them up. That's impossible, Harun protested. They are in things you can put in bottles. But then he added uncertainly, are they? If Khattam Shud could synthesize anti-stories, said the walrus with just a hint of injured pride, I should think you would accept that we can synthesize things too. As for impossible, he went on, most people would say that everything that's happened to you lately is quite, quite impossible. Why make a fuss about this particular impossible thing? There was further silence. Put in bottles. But then he added uncertainly, are they? If Khattam Shud could synthesize anti-stories, said the walrus with just a hint of injured pride, I should think you would accept that we can synthesize things too. As for impossible, he went on, most people would say that everything that's happened to you lately is quite, quite impossible. Why make a fuss about this particular impossible thing? There was further silence. Very well then, Harun said boldly. You said it could be a big wish. So it is. I come from a sad city. A city so sad that it has forgotten its name. I want you to provide a happy ending not just for my adventure, but for the whole sad city as well. Happy endings must come at the end of something, the walrus pointed out. If they happen in the middle of a story or an adventure or the like, all they do is cheer things up for a while. That will do, said Harun. Then it was time to go home. Thank you Madhurima for reading and we will now move into another example 
of Rushdie's non-fictional writing, which is almost as important as Rushdie's own novels. And Shushmita Di, Shushmita Paul, will read a section from Rushdie's anthology of non-fictional work, Imaginary Homelands. Thank you, Abin, for this opportunity. Thank you, Plato Scapes. I'm going to read from Salman Rushdie's uh, Imaginary Homelands. But there is a paradox here. The broken mirror may actually be as valuable as the one which is supposedly unflawed. Let me again try and explain this from my own experience. Before beginning Midnight's Children, I spent many months trying simply to recall as much of the Bombay of the 1950s and 1960s as I could. And not only Bombay, Kashmir too, and Delhi, and Aligarh, which in my book I have moved to Agra to heighten a certain joke about the Taj Mahal. I was genuinely amazed by how much came back to me. I found myself remembering what clothes people had worn on certain days, and school scenes and whole passages of Bombay dialogue verbatim, or so it seemed. I even remembered advertisements, film posters, the neon jeep sign on Marine Drive, toothpaste ads for Binaka and for Kolinos, and a footbridge over the local railway line, which bore on one side the legend, Esso puts a tiger in your tank, and on the other, the curiously contradictory admonition, drive like hell and you will get there. Old songs came back to me from nowhere, a street entertainer's version of Goodnight Ladies and from the film Mr. 420, the hit number Mera Juta Hai Japani, which could almost be Salim's theme song. I knew that I had tapped a rich seam, but the point I want to make is that of course I am not gifted with total recall. And it was precisely the partial nature of these memories, their fragmentation, that made them so evocative for me. The shards of memory acquired greater status, greater resonance, because they were remains. Fragmentation made trivial things seem like symbols, and the mundane acquired numinous qualities. There is an obvious parallel here with archaeology. The broken pots of antiquity, from which the past can sometimes but always provisionally be reconstructed, are exciting to discover, even if they are pieces of the most quotidian objects. It may be argued that the past is a country from which we have all emigrated, that its loss is part of our common humanity which seems to me self-evidently true, but I suggest that the writer who is out of country and even out of language may experience this loss in an intensified form. It is made more concrete for him by the physical fact of discontinuity, of his present being in a different place from his past of his being elsewhere. This may enable him to speak properly and concretely on a subject of universal significance and appeal. But let me go further. The broken glass is not merely a mirror of nostalgia. It is also, I believe, a useful tool with which to work in the present. John Fowles begins Daniel Martin with the words, whole sight, or all the rest is desolation. But human beings 
do not perceive things whole. We are not gods, but wounded creatures, cracked lenses, capable only of fractured perceptions, partial beings in all the senses of that phrase. Meaning is a shaky edifice we build out of scraps, dogmas, childhood injuries, newspaper articles, chance remarks, old films, small victories, people hated, people loved. Perhaps it is because our sense of what is the case is constructed from such inadequate materials that we defend it so fiercely, even to the death. Thank you. Thank you everyone for participating in today's reading session. It has been a wonderful reading session so far and I would like to conclude today's reading session by reading a section from one of Rushdie's more recent novels, Two Years, Eight Months and Twenty Eight Nights. It is a novel that is characterized by that same imaginative flair and verbal pyrotechnics which we have come to expect from him. But more importantly, it is a fantasy that offers us a sense of hope despite the violence, the atrocity, the chaos, the bigotry that surround us. And Rushdi himself, through his own writings, has always championed such hope. Let me illustrate the essence of this hope by reading a few of his lines. The figure of Geronimo Menezes, Mr. Geronimo the gardener, has come to mean most of all to us. The man who came unstuck from the world, then returned to it to rescue so many of his contemporaries, suffering from the dual curses of the rising and the crushing, of frightening and potentially fatal detachment from or oppressively excessive attachment to our enigmatic earth. We are pleased that he and his lady philosopher Alexandra Bliss Farina found a happy ending in each other's arms, watched over by the protective eye of Oliver Oldcastle. We walk with them in the grounds of La Inquerenza, sit silently with them as they hold hands in the sunset and watch the great river flow forward and back beneath a gibbous moon, bow our heads as they do when they stand on the estate's hill by the grave of Mr. Geronimo's lost wife, silently asking her permission for their love, silently receiving it. And we hover above the partner's desk at which, seated on opposite sides, they wrote the book in their own language, in spite of Alexandra's suggestion that it might sound better in Esperanto, which has become our most admired text from antiquity, in coherence. A plea for a world ruled by reason, tolerance, magnanimity, knowledge and restraint. That is the world in which we now live in which we have disproved the assertion made by Ghazali to Zamurud the Great. Fear did not finally drive people into the arms of God. Instead, fear was overcome. And with its defeat, men and women were able to set God aside as boys and girls put down their childhood toys or as young men and women leave their parents' home to make new homes for themselves elsewhere in the sun. For hundreds of years now, this has been our good fortune. To inhabit the possibility for which Mr. Geronimo and Miss Alexandra yearned, a peaceful, civilized world of hard work 
and respect for the land. A gardener's world in which we all must cultivate our garden, understanding that to do so is not a defeat as it was for Voltaire's poor Candide, but the victory of our better natures over the darkness within. We take pride in saying that we have become reasonable people. We are aware that conflict was for a long time the defining narrative of our species, but we have shown that the narrative can be changed. The differences between us of race, place, tongue and custom, these differences no longer divide us. They interest and engage us. We are one. And for the most part, we are content with what we have become. We might even say that we are happy. We, we speak briefly of ourselves and not the greater we. We live here in the great city and sing its praise. Flow on, rivers, as we flow on between you. Mingle currents of water as we mingle with human currents from elsewhere and from near at hand. We stand by your waters amid the seagulls and the crowds and are glad. Men and women of our city, your costumes please us, close fitting, colorless, fine. Great city, your foods, your odors, your speedy sensuality of ourselves and not the greater we, we live here in the great city and sing its praise. Flow on, rivers, as we flow on between you. Mingle currents of water as we mingle with human currents from elsewhere and from near at hand. We stand by your waters amid the seagulls and the crowds and are glad. Men and women of our city, your costumes please us, close fitting, colorless, fine. Great city, your foods, your odors, your speedy sensuality, casual encounters begun, fiercely consummated, discontinued, we accept you all. And meanings jostling in the street, rubbing shoulders with other meaning, the friction birthing new meanings unmeant by the meaners who parented them, and factories, schools, places of entertainment and ill repute, our metropolis, thrive, thrive. You are our joy, and we are yours, and so we go together, between the rivers, towards an end beyond which there is no beginning, and beyond that none, and the dawn city glistening in the sun. One hopes that Rushdi's vision will come true at some point of time for the whole of humanity, and that Sir Salman Rushdi will himself spin for us more yarns of hope and love, togetherness and plurality as he has been doing for so many decades. We wish him well and we hope that we are able to live up to the kind of ideals which his texts have steadily championed for so many decades. Thank you and good night.